Kevin Hart's car accident. That's today's topic. Hey everybody, Dr. Chris, orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine physician, and welcome to my channel where I make orthopedics and sports medicine easy to understand for you. When I woke this morning, I saw on Twitter that Kevin Hart had been injured in a car accident and that he had undergone surgery. So I don't want to talk too much about the actual incident itself, but I'll give you a quick little recap. So apparently on Sunday morning at 1 a.m. in the morning, Kevin Hart was involved in a car accident. Now at the time of the accident, Kevin Hart was not actually driving, although they were driving Kevin's car. Kevin's friend, Jared Black, was apparently driving Kevin's brand new, well, new to him anyway, 1970 Plymouth Barracuda. They were leaving Kevin's house in Calabasas and they turned off Cold Canyon and turned onto Mulholland Highway. Apparently, Jared lost control of the vehicle and drove the vehicle off the road and down an embankment. The car rolled down approximately 30 feet and Jared and Kevin were both injured. Jared's girlfriend was also in the car and she was uninjured. At the time of the crash, Kevin was able to get out of the vehicle by himself under his own power. He was able to walk back to his house where he called the emergency first responders. When the first responders arrived at the scene, the jaws of life were required to extricate both Jared and his girlfriend from the vehicle. Obviously, Kevin had already extricated himself. Both Jared and Kevin were transported to two nearby hospitals. Both of them had suffered severe back injuries and both of them had to undergo surgery. And in Kevin's case in particular, he is not expected to have any permanent sequelae after his surgery. In other words, the doctors do not expect that he will have neurologic compromise or deficits in the future. He is expected to be able to move all four limbs properly without any numbness or loss of motor function. So this brings me to what I want to talk about today. If Kevin Hart had injuries severe enough that he needed to undergo emergency surgery at the time that he was taken to the hospital, then how is it that he was able to extricate himself from the car, walk all the way home so that he could call 911 on the telephone? So when somebody presents at the hospital with some type of spinal cord or spinal column injury, there are basically two reasons why we might want to operate at that time. And those are mechanical instability. Two parts of the spine next to one another are unable to maintain their normal structural alignment. One vertebrae is unable to maintain its alignment directly over its neighbor. Or in the case of neurologic instability, the patient has suffered a sudden and sharp loss of sensation or motor function or autonomic nervous function below the level of the potential injury. It is basically only these reasons why we would want to operate on the spine in an acute setting such as this. So which one of these did he have? So let's consider first the mechanical instability. Stability of the spine is conferred by static and dynamic factors. Or in other words, things that don't move and things that move. The things that move are of course the muscles. The things that don't move are the vertebrae themselves and the ligaments in between adjacent vertebrae. If Kevin temporarily lost the function of the muscular stabilizers of the spine, we can expect him to have back pain, but this is not an indication for surgery. So we can discount that. This leaves a loss of static stabilizers of the spine as a potential cause for surgery. The spinal column itself can generally be broken down into three parts, the anterior column, the middle column, and the posterior column. The anterior and the middle column are both housed within the vertebral body itself, while the posterior column is made up of the posterior elements, that is to say, the vertebral spines and the ligaments that run in between them. Damage to any one of these columns, and in particular, the middle column, would cause a loss of structural stability of the spine, and this would be an indication for surgery. On the neurologic side, Kevin would have demonstrated a loss of nervous function 
in a discrete segment below the level of the injury. And this might manifest itself with a loss of sensation down one leg or both, a loss of motor function in one lower extremity or the other or both, or a combination of the above. It might also manifest itself with a loss of bowel or bladder function or with saddle anesthesia, a condition which causes numbness in and around the groin. Now, if he had an incomplete spinal cord injury and suffered a loss of sensation but had preservation of motor function, he would still be able to extricate himself from the vehicle, albeit with difficulty, and make his way back home. So that's a possibility. But on the other hand, if he had a significant loss of motor function, it would be quite difficult for him to get out of the vehicle and for him to walk the distance back to his house so that he could call for help. This would be something that would be quite difficult or maybe even impossible with this type of injury. On the other hand, if the loss of motor function involved only a single nerve root or affected only a small muscle grouping, then the overall motor deficit might be inconsequential and would not cause him difficulty in extricating himself from the vehicle. A loss of bowel or bladder function, although embarrassing, would not cause him any difficulty in getting out of the vehicle and walking back home. But upon arriving to the hospital, this would demonstrate neurologic compression of an emergency nature and this would require urgent decompression in the operating room. Now, I know some of you are asking, if he had a spinal fracture or a ligamentous injury of the spine, could he still extricate himself from the vehicle and walk home? Well, the answer to this is yes. I myself, as a resident, have been involved with cases where patients arrived with spinal fractures and they had basically walked into the hospital. These fractures were inherently unstable, but fortunately for those patients, and probably fortunately for Kevin Hart, they weren't so unstable that they actually shifted in position while the person was walking around. If that did happen, that, that would be a bad thing. Then you would take somebody who was potentially non-spinal cord injured and turn them into somebody who was spinal cord injured and take that person from being able to move all four extremities to suddenly being able to only move two, i.e. their arms. So what are my thoughts and what do I think actually happened to Kevin Hart? Basically, I think that Kevin Hart sustained a lumbar compression fracture. That's a type of fracture that you have in your low back, which happens when you have a forced forward flexion of the low back or the lumbar spine. Since he was involved in a rollover, I think that um, when the vehicle rolled over and he was thrown about the vehicle, at some point he probably banged his head into the roof as it hit the ground. And with all of his body weight coming down on his head, um, he probably had a um, compression fracture of his lumbar, at least his lumbar spine, if not other places in his spine. And because of that, he sustained a fracture of the lumbar vertebrae. The fracture was probably not unstable enough initially that it stopped him from walking around, but if left untreated, it might become unstable and cause him to have a spinal cord injury. So he was able to get out of the car and walk home, but he was probably having a crap ton of low back pain. When he called the first responders and they came and took him to the hospitals, one of the first things that they're gonna do when he's coming and complaining of back pain is they're going to do imaging of his spine and they're gonna do x-rays and CT scan and then if there is any neurologic compromise, they will also back that up with an MRI to look at all of the nerve roots and the spinal cord itself. When they did the imaging, they probably discovered that he had what is called a burst fracture. And this is a type of compression fracture where the back of the vertebrae, boom, the wall gets blown out. And sometimes if the wall gets blown out and the pieces go a far distance, then they can press on the spinal cord and that person has a spinal cord injury. However, 
if they only go a small distance, they may not actually press on the spinal cord and cause a spinal cord injury, but this is still an unstable situation which requires fixation. My money is on that he had a burst fracture of the lumbar spine, which was picked up on CT imaging of the spine. MRI showed that he did not have any neurologic compromise, but this is an unstable fracture pattern and the surgeons decided that they needed to do a lumbar stabilization to ensure that the vertebrae did not collapse further and more of the posterior wall of the vertebrae was not retropulsed or pushed out backwards into the spinal cord. So as it stands now, um, at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on September the 3rd. This is my best guess as to what happened to Kevin Hart. Maybe we'll find out, maybe we won't. So the date is now Thursday, September the 5th, and I'm just getting ready to post this video on Kevin Hart, and it came out in the news today that Kevin Hart actually suffered three fractures of his spine, two thoracic fractures and one fracture of the lumbar spine. All of these fractures were operated on. He had a stabilization of both the thoracic fractures and also a, uh, lumbar decompression and stabilization of the lumbar fracture as well. So hindsight being 2020, I guess that means that my assessment or my, um, my guess as to what probably happened was pretty much bang on. And although I didn't specifically call out the thoracic spine fractures, I did mention that he may have additional spinal fractures other than just the lumbar fractures, which I anticipated. Interestingly enough, the thoracic spine fractures speak to the severity of this accident. Normally, the thoracic spine is relatively stable as a result of the ribs which attach in the back and also in the front. Therefore, it is often much harder for patients to suffer thoracic spine fractures particularly of a compression nature. So although fractures of the thoracic spine are indeed possible, they happen here, it is much less likely than our fractures of the lumbar spine. So what have we learned? Dr. Chris's safety announcement of the day. Don't let other people drive your car. And if you have a rear wheel drive car with a ton of freaking horsepower, please make sure that you are able to drive that bad boy before you step on the gas. for further details, we return you now to your regularly scheduled program. Nevertheless, I wish Kevin Hart the best of luck and I hope that he recovers well without any complications or any problems in the future. At least one thing that he has in his favor is that the brother is in good shape. And certainly that'll help him recover faster. So today I've been talking about the Kevin Hart car accident. If you liked the video, be sure to give us a big thumbs up and share it with somebody that you know. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you get notified when we post new content. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday. Peace.